Hi, Wormies. If there were one required reading book for everyone, autistic or not, this would be it. Now, what's so great about what I mean when I say I'm autistic? Let's get into it. Welcome to my channel. You've come to the right place to be your authentic, weird, and wormy self. I'm Hannah, and I have autism and ADHD. I make weekly videos rating the representation of neurodiversity in the media so you can make an informed decision on what to read or watch. So hit that like and subscribe button to join the neurodiverse bookworm family and not miss out on a single recommendation. When I have my own practice as a neuropsychologist, I will be keeping a box of these books in my office to give to every patient or family after diagnosis. It's just that good, no exaggeration. I give it a five out of five stars across the board and would give it 10 if I could. What I mean when I say I'm autistic was written by Annie Kodovitz, who was only diagnosed when she was 28 years old. This book is her attempt at unpuzzling a life on the autism spectrum. Now, this book came out in 2022, about a year after I was diagnosed myself at the age of 23. I already thought I knew by that time a lot about autism, but this book gave me more words to describe my own experiences and helped me make sense of several new things. She shares the good, the bad, and the ugly about her process of self-realization and accommodating for herself. Unfortunately, many girls on the spectrum and women also go undiagnosed for decades unless they show severe symptoms that are so obvious that it's more than just some quirks because the research has historically only been done on little boys and there is a gendered difference in the presentation of the core underlying criteria. And we may wonder all our lives growing up why we're so different, why we're struggling, and we're just puzzled at the behavior of other people. Sometimes we meet people like ourselves and we're like, wow, I can talk so easily, be so comfortable around these people. And that was my experience with my friend Lena before I was diagnosed, even before I knew she was autistic. It was like, we could have been twins. I'd never lost track of talking for hours like that with anyone before. And it, it was so natural to communicate with her. And the more we talked, the more we discovered we had in common. And I wish she had suggested to me earlier that I could have been autistic, but it took a mental breakdown to get there when I was so burnt out that I couldn't mask anymore. And in that year before diagnosis, I was asked like three times if I wasn't autistic by just like random people I knew. And Annie talks about this experience. She says, years ago, before I knew I was autistic, I spent eight months living in a highly neurodiverse home. Most of my housemates had ADHD, PTSD, bipolar, autism, or some combination of those. I might have been the only one who didn't realize I was neurodivergent, that is, not neurotypical. In that house, for the first time since childhood, I didn't feel like an introvert. I got energy from being around people because I didn't feel the need to play a role. I could just be. They seemed to ignore societal expectations of how a person should sit, talk, move, dress, and act, freeing me to do the same. They also actively appreciated parts of my personality that others found annoying, such as my drive to clarify precisely what I mean. My unspoken attitude towards these friends was always, these people are so incredibly cool. Everyone who can't see past their odd mannerisms is truly missing out. I confess that I had the audacity and snobbery to imagine that strangers who saw me with them would do a double take, wondering why someone as normal as me was enjoying their company and maybe reconsider their own prejudices. But I was more like my friends than I suspected. 
that also reminds me of when I was 18, I spent about six months living with this girl who was also on the spectrum as roommates in a shared flat with other people who were attending my study internship program. Now we fought like cats and dogs. And at this point, I would never have heard anything about me being autistic. And when one of my other friends in that house suggested that I was more like this girl than I thought, I was like, absolutely no way. That is impossible. But little did I know, I was. And I so regret it being harsh on her. I think that's because I didn't understand myself at that time. And I was hard on myself. So I was taking it out on her as well, unfortunately, and our different presentations of being on the spectrum as well were opposite enough that we triggered each other, unfortunately. In what I mean when I say I'm autistic, Annie Kotovich combines theory with her personal experiences to explain what autism feels like from the inside. Chapter 7, for example, is all about misunderstandings and how people get us wrong. This chapter in particular shows that the same action can have different meanings for different people. And she says, In grocery stores, it takes all of my attention to successfully navigate my cart without running into people, while also making decisions and dealing with all the audio and visual information. It's hard to do all that and also make eye contact and smile at people, so my default demeanor could easily be perceived as rude. I wish everyone understood that my actions reflect what's happening in my senses, not what's happening in my heart. To be fair, if a neurotypical person acted like me in a grocery store, it would likely mean that they were feeling annoyed. But the same action can have a different meaning for different neurotypes. The information in this book invites us to give grace to people because you can never know what people are experiencing and what motivates them to act as they are. Sometimes even they don't have any clue. But when you realize that most people aren't going out of their way to be assholes and they're doing their best with what they have to survive, helps me at least to get a lot less bent out of shape and I'm able to be more patient with people even when their behavior otherwise I might be offended by. And in chapter eight, she talks all about meltdowns, what causes them, what might you notice that leads up to a meltdown, all of your physical symptoms and feelings, what it's like during a meltdown, and then reviewing the meltdown after it happens and analyzing it so that you can hopefully avoid this trigger in the future or minimize it. She says, a meltdown doesn't always mean that I'm upset. Often it simply means that I'm depleted. People often find autistic meltdowns confusing and ask why we're overreacting to such a small thing. Sometimes it isn't about the thing in question at all, but even if it is, it's rare for me to consider any reaction an overreaction. Overdoing something, overthinking, oversharing, etc. means doing it too much in comparison to some standard. Before we can agree that someone is overreacting, we have to agree on the standard to which we're comparing them. That standard might be how they would react if they were having a better day or how most people would react. But the standard I prefer to use is the size of the feeling. A big reaction to a big feeling isn't an overreaction. It's an accurate reaction. It's only overreacting if it's a big reaction to a small feeling because then it isn't communicating how the person really feels. And as autistic people, we often experience everything really intensely. We live on one extreme or the other in almost any continuum you can think of. And it doesn't matter whether the emotion is overwhelmingly good or just absolutely the deepest, darkest pits. 
it's usually something pretty intense. And I've come to accept that I can't have the intense highs without, unfortunately, the intense lows. And meltdowns really are a state of being overwhelmed. I remember once in my worst public meltdown as an adult that I can remember, someone asked me a question in a loud, noisy restaurant what I wanted to eat. I was already hungry, and I'd spent the previous four days on a boat doing mission work in the Amazon translating for medical providers in the Riverside communities, and so I was lacking sleep, I was exhausted, I was hungry, and I should have listened to my body telling me to just stay home, because by this time we had arrived back at our base, and I could have stayed there, but I pushed myself, and this was the last thing that pushed me over the edge when this person asked me the question in this loud, overwhelming restaurant when I was already hungry and exhausted, my body just slid out from under me and uh, I lost like almost all strength. I couldn't talk and I just kind of laid my head on the table like this and it, it was horrible. Sometimes I wonder if my extreme laughing in certain situations when I'm just triggered so that I can not stop laughing and it feels as if someone else is squeezing my ribs and diaphragm that I'm laughing for several minutes and I can't stop even when I'm not finding it funny anymore. It, at least it's a good feeling, but it's just as exhausting as the meltdowns from a bad, overwhelming feeling. Chapter 9 is all about quirks that don't fit neatly into the other previous chapters. And one of them is having two main mental modes that she calls safe mode and flexible mode. And I relate to this. Let her explain, and then I'll tell the story. I feel like my brain has two settings, which I call flexible mode and safe mode. I can usually choose which one I want to be in, though it takes some time to switch back and forth. Both have pros and cons. Flexible mode means I'm prepared for surprises and interruptions. I know they can come at any moment, so I stay alert. And when they happen, I can handle them. Safe mode means I'm able to focus without fear of interruption. I feel protected because I know that if I begin a complex thought process, it won't get cut off. The problem with flexible mode is that it doesn't allow me to think very deeply or do the kind of work I find most meaningful. It also takes a lot of energy and creates physical tension in my body. The problem with safe mode is that it makes me more vulnerable. If something breaks my concentration, it's extra upsetting, and it makes me lose my ability to think and speak clearly. I feel calmest and happiest in safe mode, but most of the time it isn't worth the risk. Even though flexible mode is harder, it isn't nearly as hard as suddenly being thrust out of safe mode by an interruption. Everything feels easier if I'm ready for it, but the hard part is remaining ready. That is so true. And especially if I'm dealing with a lot of other sensory issues and I just want to focus and concentrate on what it is that I need to get done, then getting ripped away from that is almost physically painful. And it reminds me of once when I was working in the Amazon as an English teacher and I was on my way to class. It was hot. I was tired. I didn't want to be teaching. I just wanted to be somewhere cold and dark, but I just gritted my teeth, steeled myself, and was marching to the classroom. And on the way, my now fiance stopped me saying they had changed the internet password and he was going to help me reconfigure my computer. And I snapped at him because it broke my concentration and in my mind it was almost a sensation of if you know if you're running really fast and in those cartoons when you run up there's a wall that comes up in front of you and out of nowhere and bam you hit your nose in it and it leaves you like a pug nosed that's what it felt like to me to be jerked out of my safe mode when I was 
focused and lasered in on just getting through that afternoon of teaching. What I mean when I say I'm autistic is not only accurate, authentic, and so very relatable for me, it's also very thought provoking. When she was younger, she wished she'd had clear, precise explanations. And so now as a writer, she's able to give these explanations that she wanted and help other people explain their lives. She speaks to the fear that some may have of getting a label or on the other side of those who say, oh, it's just a quirk and hey, it's a superpower. So here's what she says. It was incredibly affirming to learn the root cause of all my quirks. Autism gave me a more complete, more accurate self-image than the unflattering labels that I previously believed. I believe that autism can be a superpower because it means perceiving an abundance of sensory details and patterns. Some things are overwhelmingly beautiful. I also believe that autism can be a disability because it means struggling to process all that information. Some things are just plain overwhelming. I know that some autistic people dislike calling it a superpower because that creates pressure to display savant skills that they may not have. I also know that some people, autistic and otherwise, prefer not to think of it as a disability due to negative connotations of that term. I'm grateful that those connotations have recently been shifting in a more positive direction thanks to advocates who are proud of their disabilities. I personally see autism as a superpower, a disability, or a combination of both, depending on the situation. It's like being a mermaid who can navigate vast waters but sometimes finds herself stuck on dry land. However, my favorite way to think of autism is this. I miss what others catch, and I catch what others miss. If you read the rest of this book through that lens, you may be able to see what I've caught or missed that has led to each experience I describe, keeping in mind that other autistic people may catch or miss different things than I do. And when you grow up undiagnosed autistic, you often get told that your experience isn't reality. So you learn to just push through uncomfortable sensory situations and accept what other people tell you about it. And then when you're diagnosed, you have to puzzle through all of that and learn to accommodate yourself that life does not always have to be uncomfortable. I related to her when she said, it also took me a while to notice what I don't enjoy and begin taking action to avoid it. Not only does water hurt my skin, but sudden noises also hurt my ears. Fluorescent light hurts my eyes and cold wind hurts my necks. Yet somehow I spent years believing that life is just uncomfortable by default and trying to muffle that with happy and meaningful activities, not seeing that I could also tackle the discomfort at its source. When you don't realize you have a choice, you put up with uncomfortable experiences for far too long. Chapter 10, Optimizing Your Life, goes into this in more detail on how to meet your needs. Now, you can't meet your needs if you don't even notice them in the first place. So she gives you a checklist that can help you to identify your needs. And she says, I try to approach them with curiosity. Why do I feel this way and what changes could I make to feel better? One day, while I was cringing at the thought of putting my cold groceries away in my cold freezer, I had an epiphany. I can wear winter gloves indoors. The gloves shielded my hands from the icy packages and I wondered why I'd never thought of that before. Moreover, I wondered what caused me to think of it this particular time and how to spot similar solutions more easily in the future. And she gives four steps to recognizing them. Well, chapter 10 was all about self-accommodation and things you can do to make life easier for yourself. Chapter 11 is written to people who want to know how to support autistic people. And the principle behind this chapter is, if you want to be kind to us, then the only way is to be kind to everyone, giving the benefit of the doubt when people behave in ways you don't understand. 
she continues in chapter 12 to talk about the beauty of autism. And it's not just the good parts. She even manages to find a certain sort of beauty in the difficult parts. And she points it out that the good and the bad parts are almost always inseparable. And I want to read you a quote from the section, Annoying to Behold. Most of the times when I could tell people didn't like me, the reason, sometimes given, sometimes only suspected, was that I am annoying. But I'm not actually annoying and neither are you. In my experience, it doesn't help to notice that some people still like you in spite of your annoying traits. It helps more to notice that some people like you because of those traits in particular. But what helps me most is to separate the reaction from the traits and identify what's happening more precisely. For example, I might think, I ask a lot of questions because I value clarity. This person feels annoyed by that because they value efficiency more than I do. I like to talk about niche interests because I value them. This person feels annoyed by that because they value common interests more than I do. I sometimes speak in a monotone way because I value focusing on ideas and find it hard to focus on tone at the same time. This person feels annoyed by that because they value presentation more than I do. If you decide that you want to change your actions to get a different reaction, I support you. But do it with the understanding that you're trying to improve the relationship, not trying to fix yourself. Be aware of the toll it may take on your mental health. And if you don't succeed, know that the problem is a difference in values, not a problem with you as a person. Now, this really helped me to put it into perspective because I have always worried about coming across as annoying and that people are just putting up with me and is so kind to me because, well, that's the expected thing to do and they're just too nice to tell me that I'm annoying and wish I would go away. But I realize that I can't please everyone and everyone has different values. And so I should seek to be around people that we share similar values, but also to be aware that it isn't always me who is at fault for being annoying. At a little over 100 pages, this book is jam packed with clear concise, relatable information, especially for women on the spectrum. I've never come across a book that explained autism so clearly and concisely, beautifully and elegantly. It's so creative, positive, and balanced. And the cover, it's hard. This copy is a hard cover. And the cover design is just brilliant. I don't know how to describe it, but the whole layout of this book gives me these warm, fuzzy, cozy feelings. And in this S right here, she includes a bit of the symbolism in the infinity symbol, which some people use to represent autism instead of the stereotypical puzzle piece. And not only is the cover design beautiful and the book comfortable to hold, but the font and layout is accessible for people even with reading difficulties. She's also working on an audio version but if you're unable to read all the chapters in detail, the chapters are short and divided into subheadings so that you can easily skim over it and get the main material. And if something catches your eye, read that section in more detail. Check out Annie's blog, NeuroBeautiful, and her Facebook page with the same name. I'll link you to both down in the description. So what does it mean to you to be autistic? Tell me about your journey of self-discovery and what you've done to accommodate yourself and advocate for your needs. 
And thanks for watching. If you found this video helpful, please like and share. And if you're looking for more neurodiversity media content, then click here to see my latest review. And don't forget to comment what you would like me to review next and subscribe so you don't miss my latest recommendation.